there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. But there are also unknown knowns. The ancient and esoteric order of the Jackalope is devoted to unearthing and sharing this knowledge. Each episode we take some piece of miscellaneous esoterica that has slipped through the cracks of common knowledge and present it to you in an easily digestible format. No topic is off limits, except for the obvious. Hey there, Lodge members, and welcome to Series 8. Do you miss Shark Week? We all miss Shark Week. So here, here's some extra Shark Week for you. Scarlet Billows, presented by number 13. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is an awful place to be in the summer. In all fairness to the city of brotherly love, every city is an awful place to be in the summer. Just hot, and crowded, and miserable. And that's today. Before air conditioning, there was really only one strategy to beat the heat. Get the heck out of town. Entire families would decamp from the city to somewhere more comfortable. Country houses, lodges in the Poconos, beachside resorts in New Jersey. That's exactly what the Van Sant family of 4038 Spruce Street, Philadelphia did. On Saturday, July 1st, 1916, Dr. Eugene L. Van Sant, his son Charles, and his daughters Eugenia and Louise set out for the town of Beach Haven, New Jersey, at the south end of Long Beach Island. They arrived at 5 o'clock p.m. and checked into the Angleside Hotel. While his father and sisters unpacked, Charles decided he would rather take a swim before supper. He changed into his bathing suit and went down to the beach. He recognized the lifeguard on duty, Alexander Ott, from previous trips and waved hello. As he made his way down to the water, he ran into a friendly Chesapeake Bay retriever. He played with the dog for a few minutes in the shallow water near the shore, but eventually decided to swim out to the deeper waters beyond the lifelines and breakers. He tried to convince the dog to follow, but it seemed hesitant and turned back towards the beach. Charles was confused by his playmate's sudden reluctance, but several observers on shore were not. They saw a black fin cutting through the water and heading towards the young swimmer and yelled out a warning. Unfortunately, Charles could neither hear nor understand them and continued to take a leisurely swim. Suddenly, Van Sant gave a shriek and briefly disappeared beneath the waves. When he resurfaced, he began frantically paddling towards the shore, the waters behind him turning crimson with blood. Alexander Odd immediately dove into the surf to rescue the struggling swimmer. He reached Charles Van Sant some 40 yards offshore and saw what was causing his struggles. Some sort of bluish-gray mackerel shark, over 9 feet long and weighing at least 500 pounds. Accounts differ as to whether it was latched onto Van Sant's thigh or stalking him from a few feet away. Ott managed to get Van Sant into the shallow waters, where a human chain pulled them safely onto the beach. It soon became clear just how severe Van Sant's injuries were. The shark had ripped all the flesh off the back of his right thigh from the hip to the knee, exposing the bone. Ott frantically tried to stop the bleeding with a makeshift tourniquet, while beachgoers watched on in horror. Dr. Van Sant and a friendly medical student went down to the beach and managed to carry the unconscious Charles back to the manager's office at the hotel and lay him out on the desk. It soon became clear that Charles' injuries were too much for Dr. Van Sant to handle. He was an otolaryngologist, for God's sakes, not a trauma surgeon. Local physician Dr. Herbert Willis was called in, along with Dr. Joseph Neff, Philadelphia's director of public health, who was vacationing nearby. The three men discussed transporting Charles to the nearest hospital, some 30 miles away in Tom's River, but concluded that their patient had lost too much blood to make the trip feasible. Charles Epting Van Sant was pronounced dead of his injuries at 6.45 p.m. He was 23 years old. As news of the shark attack spread, the general public began to worry about the sudden appearance of a man-eating shark off the normally safe Jersey Shore. Marine biologists responded quickly to inform the general public, informed them that, actually, there were some 20 species of sharks that made the mid-Atlantic waters their home, including several species commonly thought of as man-eaters. But they also reassured the public that they had nothing to worry about. Charles Van Sant's death, while tragic, was a statistical anomaly, a freak. Maybe the shark had accidentally bit Van Sant while trying to attack the dog. Maybe it had been confused by the full-body black swimsuit that made him look a little bit like a seal. In any case, they reminded everyone that dangerous man-eating sharks rarely ventured out of tropical waters, and the ones in temperate waters would never attack humans unless provoked. In the 1890s, eccentric millionaire Herman Ulrichs had offered $500 to anyone who could provide physical evidence of a shark attacking a human anywhere north of Cape Hatteras. It never claimed. Fish Commissioner James M. Meehan of Philadelphia even declared that, Despite the death of Charles Epting Van Sant at Beach Haven Saturday and the report that two sharks have been caught in that vicinity recently, I do not believe there is any reason why people should hesitate to go in swimming at the beaches for fear of man-eaters. Maybe the marine biologists should have been reading the newspapers, because in the summer of 1916, 
they were filled with stories of sharks behaving strangely up and down the East Coast. Here are some highlights. On June 21st, a sailor in the Gulf of Mexico was bit on the leg by a shark that had been hauled up on the deck of his trawler. On June 22nd, a trio of fishermen in Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey had to fight off a shark that attacked their boat. On June 23rd, the good people of Pablo Beach, Florida, witnessed multiple sharks working in unison to attack a pod of whales. Sailors reported seeing similar schools of 100 sharks or more. On June 27th, two fishermen in Staten Island, New York, were chased back to port by a monster 10-foot shark. And on July 1st, the same day as the Van Sant attack, fishermen near Beach Haven caught and killed multiple sharks, each one just over the size where they would be considered man-eaters. And it wasn't just along the East Coast. In 1916, shark populations in the Western Atlantic Ocean were just booming. They were so plentiful that shark meat was flooding into fish markets, where it was being sold as swordfish. The Austrian Marine Board considered them such a nuisance that they were offering significant bounties for fishermen who could capture or kill man-eaters. Marine biologists chose not to emphasize those facts, though, and they weren't alone. Municipal governments up and down the Jersey Shore reassured the public that their beaches were completely safe, and there was no reason to stay away or cancel their Independence Day hotel reservations. Even so, many beachside communities took the extra precaution of safeguarding their beaches with wire nets positioned some 100 yards offshore. Spring Lake, New Jersey is about 45 miles north of Beach Haven. In 1916, it was considered the ritziest resort town on the Jersey Shore, and the Essex and Sussex Hotel was its most luxurious hotel. At 1.45 p.m. on Thursday, July 6th, several of the Essex and Sussex's menial employees decided to take a dip on their lunch break. They knew they couldn't venture past the employee section of the beach, but it would still give them plenty of time to scope out the pretty young guests staying through the holiday week. With the recent Beach Haven shark attack on their mind, most of the employees decided to hew close to shore. Daring and athletic bellhop Charles Bruder, though, swam out past the lifelines and breakers and nets over 130 yards from shore. Suddenly, a woman on the guest beach screamed and ran to the lifeguards. The man in the red canoe is upset! Lifeguards Chris Anderson and George White were confused. There wasn't anyone canoeing out there, was there? Then a strange shape left from the water, or possibly was flung out of the water. It screamed, and the lifeguards realized it was Charles Bruder. They hadn't recognized him at first, because his right leg was missing. The red canoe the guest had seen was a spray of blood from his bloody stump. Anderson and White launched the lifeboat and sped out to Bruder's location. As they drew near, Bruder shouted, A shark bit me! Bit my legs off! The lifeguards didn't see any sharks, but they had little reason to doubt the story. Bruder's right leg had been bitten off below the knee, and so had his left foot. Most of the flesh on his legs had been stripped of skin and muscle. A huge gash on his side exposed his ribs. As his rescuers raced against time and the bottom of the lifeboat slowly filled with blood, Bruder drifted off into unconsciousness. He died before the boat reached shore. He was 28 years old. Doctors called to attend to Bruder's remains had to delay examining the body to treat onlookers who had fainted at the grisly sight. Meanwhile, a quick-thinking socialite commandeered the hotel switchboard and alerted every resort up and down the coast, warning them to get bathers out of the water now. If Van Sant's death worried the general public, Bruder's death threw them into a blind panic. Scientists once again tried to calm everyone down, declaring that no one had seen whatever had attacked Bruder, that sharks didn't have the jaw strength to sever human limbs, the large sharks rarely ventured into shallow waters, and that two shark attacks in such a short period of time was a sort of freak occurrence that only happened once in a millennium. The general public, of course, did not find any of that calming in the least. Instead of listening to the scientists, they listened to the old salts, who declared that a man-eating shark had killed twice and would not stop killing until it was destroyed. The resorts declared open season on sharks, augmenting their wire netting with patrol boats armed with shotguns and harpoons. The New York Evening World offered a $100 reward to anyone who could capture the man-eater, which brought out every fisherman in New Jersey to try and claim the bounty. On July 7th, field and stream columnist E.F. Warner captured a large sandbar shark near Beach Haven and polished it off with three shots to the head from his 38 caliber pistol. Not very sporting, if you ask me. That same day, two Spring Lake boaters spotted a bearded shark and fired at it with a rifle, the bullets only ricocheted off its hide. Further north, four members of the Bayonne Police Department spotted a 12-foot shark headed towards several swimming children and started firing blindly at it with their service revolvers. 
Fortunately, they didn't hit the children, but the shark escaped. On July 8th, Asbury Park lifeguard Ben Everingham was attacked by a different 12-foot shark and had to fend it off with an oar until it lost interest and turned back to the sea. A 7-foot shark that attacked several fishermen near Canarsie was not so lucky and was beaten to death in shallow water. On July 9th, two sharks were caught in a Toms River fish pond. They were captured, killed, and cut open. It turned out one of them had a solid gold wedding ring in its stomach. On July 10th, an injured blue-nosed shark was captured in Monmouth Beach. Its injuries matched the one that Everingham had inflicted on his attacker two days earlier. Meanwhile, the nephew of Republican presidential candidate Charles Evan Hughes was rattled by a shark who swam under his canoe, threatening his lady friend. Fisherman John Ketchum was out in the South Bay when a school of hungry sharks tried to capsize his boat and eat him alive. Other schools were spotted in Raritan Bay and Bayards Bay. A shark attacked another boy near Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn, but he escaped with his life. Now, I would be surprised if even half of these stories turned out to be true, and I suspect even the true ones are wild exaggerations. Even so, sport fishermen were definitely having a moment. Hardly a day went by without multiple 8-foot to 12-foot sharks being pulled from the water. Scientists were quick to point out that sharks that long were not actually uncommon, but no one was listening. On Wednesday, July 12th, Captain Thomas Cottrell was returning to Matawan, New Jersey from a fishing trip when he spotted a large shark swimming up Matawan Creek with the high tide. Cottrell dashed to the nearest telephone and called the Matawan Police Department. The police were not impressed. A shark? In Matawan, New Jersey? Two miles inland? Not bloody likely. They dismissed Cottrell's warning as shark-induced hysteria and hung up. Cottrell decided if the police wouldn't act, he would. He hopped on a nearby motorboat and went up the creek to warn as many people as he could, most of whom didn't believe him either. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, a group of local boys were goofing around in a swimming hole near the Wickoff docks. As they were playing, they noticed an old weather-beaten log bobbed to the surface. But they had more important things to pay attention to, like a kid doing some sick backflips. Rad. Then, young Lester Stilwell screamed as the old log surged toward him, revealing a mouthful of gleaming white teeth. He was dragged beneath the surface. His friends got out of the water as soon as they could and ran back to town stark naked, yelling shark the whole way. Adults swarmed to the creek to see what they could do to help. They dismissed the shark talk as mere hysteria, but they worried that poor Lester Stilwell had suffered an epileptic seizure or had become stuck on some submerged debris. They knew the boy was almost certainly dead. He had been under for over half an hour. But at the very least, they could recover his body. One group of responders blocked the creek with a sheet of chicken wire, hoping to trap the body before it drifted out with the tide. Others poked into the creeks with sticks, searching for the body, while popular tailor Watson Stanley Fisher took the more direct approach of diving into the deepest part of the creek. Fisher surfaced and claimed to have spotted the boy's body trapped beneath a log, then announced he was going to make another dive to try and free it. When he surfaced a second time, he began stumbling towards shore, only to be attacked from behind by a shark as he reached waist-deep water. The crowd watched in stunned horror as Fisher was mauled by the shark, none of them moving a muscle to help. Then the shark fled, slamming into the chicken wire barrier so forcefully that it was thrown down like if it had been hit by a truck. A local physician treated Watson's wounds as best as he could, but they needed more than first aid. The entire back of his left leg had been stripped of flesh. He was carried up an embankment to a nearby train station, where a train whisked him away to the Long Branch and Monmouth Memorial Hospital. Doctors prepared to remove his leg in an attempt to save his life, but he had already lost too much blood. He was declared dead at 6.35 p.m. He was 24 years old. Further downstream, another group of boys were playing in a swimming hole at Cliffwood Beach when the shark arrived. They scrambled to get out of the water, but young Joseph Dunn was furthest away from the dock and couldn't make it in time. The shark latched onto his left foot and dragged him downstream a considerable distance. The other kids formed a human chain, pulled Joseph free of the water, and got him to St. Peter's Hospital by car. His wounds were severe, but he eventually recovered and lived to a ripe old age, dying in 1982. What was left of Lester Stilwell's body was discovered two days later, beached near a railroad bridge. He was 11 years old. The grieving folks of Matawan sprung into action. First, they dumped so much dynamite into the creek that they probably killed most of the fish in it. Then they declared a bounty on sharks. Very unusual for a landlocked borough. Captain Cottrell tried to claim it, but he was dogged by rumors that the shark he'd caught was actually purchased from another fisherman further down the coast. 
The Asbury Park Fishing Club caught a shark at the mouth of Lake Takanasi that they dubbed the Takanasi Tiger, but it didn't seem large enough to be the Matawan man either. A more likely candidate was caught by Barnum and Bailey Lyman tamer Michael Schleiser out in Raritan Bay. Schleiser's shark was big enough that it had briefly towed his rowboat backwards and had to be beaten to death with a broken oar. When cut open, it was discovered to have a belly full of human skin, fat, and muscle, and the shinbone of a child. For the next few weeks, sharks were spotted everywhere. They were seen off Prince's Bay, New Brighton, Raritan Bay, Brighton Beach, and Coney Island. Sightings in Oyster Bay encouraged a local matron to go shark hunting from her seaplane. Further down the coast, a mob of angry bathers attacked a school of man-eating sharks with axes and drove them out to deep waters. In a tragic and avoidable accident, a man in Newark drowned in shallow waters because beachgoers, afraid of sharks, refused to enter the water. Even the high seas were full of sharks. The crew of the wrecked coal steamer Ramos were attacked by sharks as they tried to escape in their lifeboats, and the missing crew of the wrecked Gary Strong were assumed to have been devoured by sharks. And in perhaps the oddest turn of this story, pioneering science fiction editor Hugo Gernsback proposed a solution to the shark problem, dragging fish hooks attached to a live wire behind ships to electrocute hungry sharks. And then, after the first week of August, sightings just petered out as beach season wound down. By the end of August, shark sightings had practically disappeared. By September, they had stopped entirely. As the tragic shark attacks faded from the front pages, the scientific community tried to put their heads together and figure out what had happened over the summer. First, they needed to figure out which media reports were actually accurate. Many of the so-called shark sightings may have actually been swordfish or mackerel. Reports of sharks traveling in schools were almost always misidentified porpoises porpoises who didn't deserve to be attacked by axes wielded by angry Asbury Park bathers. Even so, they could not deny shark attacks that had been witnessed by dozens of people. They had to concede that sharks did indeed have the jaw strength to break human bones, and that they would attack humans unprovoked. But why now? Some of the wackier explanations that were proposed could be dismissed out of hand. For instance, it seems highly unlikely that the German Navy was testing a secret shark-agitating weapon in neutral waters. It also seems unlikely that sharks had been driven out of the North Atlantic by unrestricted submarine warfare, or that they had developed the taste for human flesh from feasting on the casualties of naval battles. Some scientists proposed that shifting ocean currents had moved the range of man-eating sharks further north. It was an interesting hypothesis, but subsequent studies showed no change in the Gulf Stream's position. Others claimed that sharks were attacking humans because they were desperate from hunger, either caused by a reduction in shipping traffic that deprived them of their traditional source of edible refuse, or perhaps just the depletion of coastal fisheries. This hypothesis had problems, partly because sharks didn't rely on garbage as a large part of their diet, and partly because there was no real indication that coastal fisheries were any worse in 1916 than in any other recent year. Besides, sharks are not picky eaters. They'll eat anything they can find, and there were still plenty of fish in the sea. In the end, Scientists just threw their hands up and declared that 1916 was a shark year. It seemed likely that the abundance of sharks was due to nothing more than the regular fluctuations of the predator-prey cycle. The increased population pressure would have pushed some sharks into shallower waters and encouraged them to be less picky and more aggressive. It's likely the shark boom wasn't actually all that large. Poorly researched stories in the newspapers exaggerated the size of the problem and fueled public hysteria, which then led to more poorly researched stories and so on. Shark populations were also significantly up in 1915 and 1917, for example, but they didn't get extensive media coverage or cause a general panic. The odds of being attacked by a shark are still rather slim. For coastal dwellers, it's only 1 in 3.7 million. You are still more likely to be struck by lightning, 1 in 1.2 million, win an Olympic medal, 1 in 622,000, or be injured in a toilet-related accident, 1 in 10,000. Slim comfort, I suppose to the families of Charles Van Sant, Charles Bruder, Lester Stilwell, and Stanley Fisher. Our key sources for this episode include Richard G. Fernicola's 12 Days of Terror and contemporary newspaper accounts. We have no connections this week. Instead, I'm going to suggest that you try out Tripwire Interactive's game Maneater, where you get to play as a shark and rampage your way through a series of increasingly absurd environments. Is it the greatest game in the world? No. Is it enormously fun? Oh, oh yeah. It was the perfect distraction back when I first got locked up here in the quarantine bunker. Plus, there's some DLC coming at the end of August, which it looks like it'll be pretty fun. And I should stress, 
not a paid ad. This is just me declaring my love for the game. And that's all for this week, Lodge members. We'll be back in two weeks with an episode number seven is currently calling Judge Crater, Call Your Office. Until then, qui quid minime sciant, optime scure. Scarlet Billows was written and produced by David White for the Ancient and Esoteric Order of the Jackalow and is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All rights reserved, all wrongs reversed. The script for this episode, with sources, links, and more, can be found on our website, orderofthejackalope.com. That's Order of the Jackalope, with hyphens between the words. Do you have opinions about this episode? Why not share them over on our Discord server, The Warren? There's a link in the show notes and over on our website or tag one of our social media accounts. We can be found at Order Jackalope on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, and Tumblr. If social media is not your thing, send us an email at jackalope at orderofthejackalope.com. We're looking for new Lodge members. We'll initiate anyone into the secret mysteries. They share a secret mystery of their own first. Visit our website and click join us for more information.